Good evening, virtual audience, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Hilary Carr, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this event with Cheryl Cashin, presenting her new book, White Space, Black Hood, Opportunity Hoarding and Segregation in the Age of Inequality, joined in conversation by Tamiko Brown-Nagan. Thank you for joining us tonight. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our new digital community. Every week we'll be hosting events here on our Zoom account. As always, our event schedule also appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can sign up for our email newsletter and browse our bookshelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. This event will also have closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable the captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase White Space Black Hood on harvard.com, as well as a link to donate in support of this series in our store. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you for showing up and tuning in in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over this past year, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. And we thank you in advance for your patience and understanding. And so now I'm so pleased to introduce tonight's speakers. Cheryl Cashin is the Carmack Waterhouse Professor of Law, Civil Rights and Social Justice at Georgetown University, a contributing editor for Politico Magazine and an active member of the Poverty and Race Research Action Council. She's previously been a law clerk to US Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, as well as an advisor on community development in inner city neighborhoods to the Clinton White House. Her work has appeared in numerous outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, Salon, and The Root, among many others. And she's the author of the New York, Time book, New York Times book review editor's choice, The Failures of Integration, the NAACP Image Award nominated Place Not Race, and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award nominated Loving, Interracial Intimacy in America and the Threat to White Supremacy. Tonight, Professor Cashin will be joined by Tamiko Brown-Nagan, the Dean of Radcliffe University for Advanced Study, professor of, law, professor of Constitutional Law at Harvard Law and of History in Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Dean Brown-Nagan is the author of the, of the book, Courage to Dissent, Atlanta and the Long History of the Civil Rights Movement. These two will be discussing Professor Cashin's latest book, White Space, Black Hood, which Kirkus Reviews called a resonant important argument that white supremacy and racial division poison life in our cities. And Henry Louis Gates Jr. called it brilliant and nuanced, going on to say that it convinces the, the reader of the centrality of geography and economic and social inequality. We're so happy to have them both here tonight. So without further ado, the digital podium is yours, Dean Brown Nagan and Professor Cashin. Thank you so much, Hillary, and uh, thank you to the Harvard Bookstore for hosting this talk. It is my pleasure to be in conversation with Cheryl Cashin, who has written this, her fifth book. And I wanna start off, Cheryl, by asking you why you decided to write this book. Well, part of it, as you know, is your fault. <laughs> I don't know, it was about four years ago, five years ago, that I got a, a call from you asking me if I would like to give the Biddle Memorial Lecture at my alma mater, Harvard Law School. I was flattered and flabbergasted thinking, what will I say, you know, at this institution where, you know, a lot of my former professors are still on the faculty. And so it really forced me to think ambitiously, like what, what would be worthy of the occasion? And I, I've spent my, my entire academic career thinking about segregation and was very, um, uh, inspired by Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, and the way um, she connected contemporary mass incarceration to a prior uh, anti-Black institution, Jim Crow. Um, but I, I, I wanted to see the connection from slavery to Jim Crow to the I iconic um, segregation, um, Black ghettos, Black hoods. Um, and, and because it just seemed like each time we put to bed one black sporting institution, we created another, right? Um, so, you know, supremacy still manifests and just the structures change and the ideology around it changes. So that's why, that is one of the reasons I wanted, because I, I had to find something ambitious to say to my alma mater. But the other thing is I have been passionate my entire life 
about, and I get this from my family, I come from a civil rights family in Alabama, about um, low income black people and how they're othered in the society, how they're, they're you know, they're treated um, um, not just by, you know, whites, but even by, you know, middle and upper class black, they're sort of like, you know, um, it's sometimes, well, you, you get the point. Mm -hmm. I feel very passionate. I call the folks trapped in high poverty black neighborhoods descendants in recognition of the connection uh, to slavery. They're the true descendants of slavery. And as I said in the um, um, introduction, I, I see them with love and I wrote this book to humanize them and to advocate for them. Mm. Well, Cheryl, I have to say your lecture was impressive four or five <laughs> years ago, and this book is really impressive. It is the total package. You uh, combine historical and legal analysis. Uh, you discuss all of the relevant scholarship, and you, know, you and I uh, uh, work in some of the same areas, uh, scholarly areas. So I, I know that scholarship, and it really is all in there. And going beyond that, you combine storytelling and policy solutions, and you do it all in 200 pages. So it is, it is just a really impressive book, and I truly congratulate you on the achievement. Thank you so much, Tamika. That means the world to me. Now, for those who haven't had a chance to read the book yet, why don't you go through and give us a, a brief overview of the argument that you make? Okay. Well, what I'm arguing is that racial inequality that you see in American society uh, is best explained by understanding that we have a system of residential caste that produces it, right? Um, we intentionally constructed affluent white space and the iconic black hood. Um, and the one wouldn't exist without the other. Uh, you know, high, in, high opportunity, uh, poverty free bastions couldn't exist if we didn't concentrate poverty elsewhere. And these two extremes of residential caste are the most persistent kinds of neighborhoods that we have. In fact, the, 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 the boundaries of affluent white space and concentrated black poverty are hardening. Um, those neighborhoods are persisting and not going away. There's a lot in between, but what I argue is that uh, everyone in American society who cannot buy their way into affluent white spaces uh, which also happened, to, they're emerging to be heavily Asian as well, um, gets a very different deal when it comes to opportunity. Uh, people trapped in, in the hood get the worst deal. Uh, and I'm saying that residential caste is the chief explanation for the structural systemic racism that we have. And I explain that, that, three, that residential caste in America is animated by three primary anti-Black processes. Boundary maintenance, which is a polite word for segregation, mm -hmm. um, opportunity hoarding, over-investing in affluent white space, disinvesting elsewhere, and stereotype-driven surveillance, uh, predatory policing, and also private policing of Black bodies. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, the argument of the book. And I also, and I call for abolition and repair of American residential caste. Yes, thank you. So I, I want to end up on that, uh, that uh, discussion of abolition, but I, I want to ask you about some of your word choices. Um, okay. You use the term caste throughout the book, as opposed to say racial subordination or marginalization or just plain old racism. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder what to you is the explanatory power of caste as a concept? Okay, I say residential caste. Yes. It's a very popular book by the same title. And I'm not talking about just social caste, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the word is powerful. Um, it, it evokes more than just racism. It, it, you know, people 
who are in high poverty neighborhoods are essentially trapped there. Very few people uh, are able to get out. That's a caste system, mm. right? Um, it also, caste also evokes um, the degree of othering um, that's attached to uh, folks in the hood, right? The, st the stereotypes and really nasty stereotypes, super predator, thug, welfare queen, ghetto, right? Um, some of the worst stereotypes of blackness are incubated by, you know, in, in the hood. I mean, you know, are based on a lot of ideas about what goes on there, often generated by people who have no intimate knowledge of, of black people, right? Mm -hmm. So I think caste is more powerful than just saying racism, mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and um, I, for me, caste evokes, you know, entrenched structures. Yes. Um, and residential caste is nothing if not structural. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the social distinctions that come naturally to human beings become much more efficient when you overlay it with geography, right? Those people over there um, aren't worthy of coming to live in my space, mm -hmm. right? People, people come up with uh, reasons to justify the way things are. And the, 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 I have a, a chapter, as you know, about mythology, right? Um, I call it ghetto mythology, but the chief mythology animating residential caste is that high opportunity uh, living is earned and uh, people trapped in, in low poverty areas uh, that's the deserved result of individual bad behavior, you know, um, and that erases and, and masks a century of nefarious public policies um, that systemically create, uh, actually render some neighborhoods devoid of any, any real opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think it's a, an appropriate word and <laughs> Uh, as you say, it's powerful. It gets to the permanence of a situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being totally devoid of opportunity, being trapped. It, it's, it's a very powerful word choice. Now, you also, as you mentioned at the top, use the word descendants. Mm -hmm. um, and you tell stories about descendants in every chapter. Can you say uh, a bit about why that uh, was a choice for this book? Well, for me, descendants is a term of affection, of love, of you know, honoring um, an African American legacy. Um, the word words used to describe Black Americans, particularly poor Black Americans, are often um, have negative connotations, right? Um, you know, the N word, ghetto, whatever. But I, so I just found it to be. It also evokes the truth that, you know, African-Americans emancipated after the Civil War were overwhelmingly in the South, right? Their descendants became, became great migrants, actually the early great migrants, some of them may have been enslaved, right? But their descendants, lots of them were great migrants. So they go North and South to escape Jim Crow and what the primary response to black people in large numbers, wherever they landed was to contain them and uh, hyper segregated neighborhoods um, and to disinvest in those neighborhoods, um, making them much worse than other places. Um, and I guarantee you the folks who live in the hood, I guarantee you that overwhelmingly those folks are descendants of, the enslaved. Mm -hmm. There's a continuum, a direct continuum, which I just described. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, really important to talk about. Uh, mm -hmm. Not a lot of people do uh, make those connections. And I, I think it's, it's uh, again, a, a very appropriate uh, term. Um, so I, I think I want to finish the second half of your question. You asked oh, sure. why I featured them in, in, yeah. in every chapter. And thank you for noticing that. Every chapter opens with and features a character or two 
and I tried to get their pictures, a lot of them, I wanted to humanize my people, black people. We're three dimensional human beings. And, you know, and, and many of the people I feature are people who overcame something that inspired me, right? So I have photographs of them, I tell their story, um, and I do it chronologically, you know, and I, that's how, you know, um, so the, I make the connection because I, you know, have a chapter, it, I go from 1890 straight through and I do it really, really fast, as you know, we get to the contemporary part quite quickly. But I wanted to humanize, like I said, I really wrote this for black people, particularly black Americans. Uh, and I was very influenced, actually I have her here. I was very influenced by Toni Morrison and in this book of essays, she writes about how, um, you know, well, first of all, her whole career, she centered the black American experience. Mm -hmm. and, and, and she wrote that for herself, for others. She didn't, you know, I mean, she wasn't trying to appeal to any other audience, right? So I was, I, I wanted to write a book was, was truly like, here's the truth about what our people have been through. Um, and she says in the book I just pulled out in one essay, it jumped out at me that, um, you know, racial oppression may never go away. It may never change, but we can write about it. You know, mm -hmm. we can tell the truth. And that's what I set out to do, to, to, to make it clear to myself and my, and my people, all of these forces that are set against us and they never seem to stop, right? I, and um, the more I learned, the angrier I was, but I wanted to just tell the truth about that. Um, and, you know, I wanted it to be a bit of a Bible, frankly, where people, if you want to understand why it is, you know, here, 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 here. Mm. Yes. Um, so can you, can you tell us uh, one of those stories? Let's pick a chapter and talk oh, about Oh, okay. Um, oh, so many come to me, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to pick, um, Lakia Barnett, okay, uh, who is a descendant in the technical sense and that she lives in a high poverty black neighborhood in Washington, DC. And I interviewed her several times, went to her neighborhood. She lives in, in um, you know, a very, very poor area in Southeast DC near the um, um, Maryland line. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to know her because she was a client of a Georgetown Law Health Law Clinic. And to meet this woman, she's a dynamo. She's a really impressive person to me. She has a lot of knowledge and a lot of gumption. And she actually had been uh, middle class and through some unfortunate circumstances, found herself and her, and her family homeless. Um, and I, I follow her through the struggle to get some stable housing. And she was actually more functional than a lot of people around her in this homeless shelter and, and really took advantage of all the services that the Georgetown Law students provided her. And I really, I try to show how much assistance she needed um, and it took a lawsuit because she was discriminated against. She got a housing voucher and you're not supposed to, it's illegal in Washington DC to discriminate based on a uh, source of income. You know, she had one of those uh, rare, hard to get HUD opportunity vouchers. Um, and I, I, you know, but for Georgetown law students helping her sue, she got a settlement and putting pressure on the housing authority in DC, which finally, because the, 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 the housing voucher is, is good, you only get like three months or something to get your placement. You know, they finally got some emergency assistance where they put her in a van and drove her to certain spots, you know, but she started out, someone had told her in a high opportunity, maybe they take the voucher and then they backed out, right? So I just show the struggle and then trying to get her kids in a decent school. Um, and she's, she's 10 minutes away from where there's a lot of gun violence, but she, this is a person who's written books 
um, you know, who's produced, um, uh, pl uh, she's got this movement of women who've endured, you know, all kinds of things where they sort of have a monologue where they do their play. She's just, you know, um, a striver. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, 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 that's a modern descendant. I, I could go on, you know, um, but that's one example. Yeah. Well, the, the storytelling is powerful mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's clear to, to me and to, to the audience that you have a lot of passion uh, as well as the scholarly expertise. And that comes through so much in, in this work. Now, Cheryl, I want to go Can back. Interrupt you? Did you have a favorite character? I'm just curious. Did, did anyone jump out at you by any chance? Well, um, I was attracted to the concept. Uh, it's something that I try to do uh, mm -hmm. as well, tell stories. Um, although, uh, well, I, I wanna go back to something in particular that you, you just said. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that this book, you want it to be like a Bible. And you said that you wrote it for the African-American community. Um, and one of the things you talk about uh, implicitly, but also directly in the book is the separation between the descendants mm -hmm. and the black middle class and certainly affluent black Americans. Right. Right. And so let's talk about that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, so let's talk about the contrast between the progress of the black middle class and those who were trapped in these ghettos. Yeah. Um, what dilemmas does the black middle class face, including uh, affluent people, including black officials who control majority back, black cities? Tell mm -hmm. us about the dilemmas and how you would recommend trying to resolve some of those dilemmas. Okay, well, first I wanna make it clear to the audience that I centered the African-American experience but I, I would welcome anybody reading it, right? Um, but I, I definitely had African-Americans and their experience in mind as I was writing this. Okay, well, you're asking, you, you hit the nail off the head, haven't you? So what, what, one of the points I'm making is, um, but pre-civil rights, we had a caste system that was just based on race. And, and in the South, particularly, no matter what your socioeconomic state is, you were in that caste system too, right? Mm -hmm. Post-civil rights, the good thing is um, there people who prosper are, were able to exit the hood. You know, back in the day when it was created, all socio socioeconomic strata of black people lived together, but the Fair Housing Act opened up for opportunities and most people who could exit high poverty neighborhoods of whatever color do. In fact, the, the economic segregation is growing fastest among African-Americans and Latinx people. Mm. Black and Latino one percenters are, are moving to higher ground. And it does present a dilemma. And you know, James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, kind of speaks to this. Mm. Um, you know, Democrats outnumber Republicans like 12 to one in this city. And um, when uh, DC, the city I live in, Washington DC was Chocolate City overwhelmingly um, run by black people. Um, they pursued mass incarceration too, right? And yeah, I'm sh I, I have heard words uttered about low income black people that are the same kind of stereotypes that non-Black people participate in, right? And, you know, in, in a society that concentrates, uh, a, a but concentrates advantage and concentrates disadvantage, all people, uh, particularly, as you know this, people who are parents, feel pressure to get as close to the high opportunity as they can, mm -hmm. right? Um, I live this in Washington DC, right? And so the dilemma is um, distancing yourself from concentrated poverty is, and, and by the way, concentrated poverty is growing fast in the suburbs and it's growing fast in, in white areas too, right? But distancing yourself 
from concentrated poverty and, and concentrated disadvantage becomes necessary to thrive. And so we, so, you know, part of the reason is descendants are worse off than they were before the civil rights revolution because they lost the uh, proximity to our most successful black people. And they lost the sort of the, their social influence. You know, they lost their tax dollars and there's a lot of social distance now. Um, it's a, yeah, so it is a dilemma, you know, and I, I live that myself. I, I put my kids in public charter schools for the first seven years and each year of their education from first grade to through seventh grade, each year the poverty rate grew higher. The last year they were in uh, school, 53% of the kids were on free and reduced lunch. And I walked the walk as long as it worked for my kids, but it began not to work so much. Um, you know, uh, that's the dilemma. It is. And uh, of course, it's a, a dilemma that I'm familiar with myself. And I think this book um, really, as you said, uh, will, will help a whole lot of people understand um, the plight of people who are descendants uh, and not fall prey to the mythology that affects everyone in this country. Um, so, so let me ask you about white allies and people of color allies, uh, how they're implicated in the problem you identify, what stories are they telling themselves about concentrated poverty, and, and why should they care about these unique circumstances, unique to uh, African Americans? Okay. Well, everybody should care about residential caste because actually it's only working for a very small fraction uh, for those who live in a metropolitan area. Only about 7% of the population can buy their way into the, the, the highest opportunity places, right? And those places um, exclude, they have exclusionary zoning. They, 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 they won't, often won't even have apartments. Uh, let alone duplexes or quadplexes, right? Um, so they exclude uh, non-rich people. And what a lot of people don't realize is they're actually subsidized by everybody who's excluded. You know, they get golden infrastructure um, um, that's paid for through gas taxes, right? Um, they often get more than their fair share of, of revenues raised through income taxes in terms of, you know, like what, what the state decides to, to invest in for development, physical development, right? Um, and so the, this, this whole system is destroying opportunity for almost everyone, um, whether you live in a city or a non-rich suburb, there are a lot of struggling suburbs out there now, or a rural area, America is no longer a land of opportunity for you. It's not an engine of opportunity, right? Um, and, and, you know, we have a politics that's, you know, cut taxes, cut taxes, it, you know, Biden's trying to change that, but um, we have a politics that um, has historically maligned the, you know, the people trapped in the worst hoods, right? But that's masking this system that structures opportunity. Uh, it also destroys politics, right? Our, 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 our severe segregation facilitates this extreme partisan gerrymandering. So you should care. And I would say even to the affluent person who uh, lives on in high ground, you should care. I mean, I live in a neighborhood that I, I have to admit um, is pr pretty affluent. Um, I mean, it's not the most affluent in, in Washington, D.C., but it's a, a neighborhood of, of, of progressive and kind people who have a lot of Black Lives Matter signs and we believe in science. And I suspect you live in a neighborhood like that, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I, I don't think my neighbors would call, call, call the police on, on, on my Black sons in an unexplained situation. I'd like to believe that, right? But... Um, so many people, and we saw this with the, um, the social protest after George Floyd's uh, slow execution, 
Um, so many people I think in this country are hungry for something better than toxic division, um, fear, a society based on fear, separation. Everybody has to scratch and claw so much. If, if, we, if we followed my suggestions for repair, abolition and repair, we would stabilize a lot of neighborhoods. There would be a lot nicer neighborhoods that are less scary to people and you'd have more opportunity to return to public institutions, right? right? Uh, a lot of high income people, um, I mean, the, 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 high, the hyper affluent are always gonna be in their own universes, but you know, two parent professionals feel the need to buy the most expensive house they can afford either to get into good schools or put, spend a lot of after tax dollars for private school um, to, to, to basically get to opportunity that's stable and good. Great, right? Um, in a society that wasn't based on residential caste, that had an attitude of care rather than predation, particularly for descendants, um, and less not fear and othering, uh, I think opportunity would be more widely distributed for everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great, great answer and uh, insight that I, I hope it's persuasive to your readers. I'm going to turn to audience questions in just a moment. So I would ask our audience to please uh, post your questions uh, uh, so that I can uh, ask Cheryl about what's on your mind. But first, I want to turn to Cheryl the question of what to do about all of this. There is a chapter that's titled Abolition and Repair. I wonder if you could share what's in that chapter. What, what's your vision of what needs to be done to dismantle and replace residential caste? Well, I want to start off by saying that um, I my starting point was reading W. E. B. Boys, Angela Davis. I'm not the first person to talk about I, I, abolition and creating an abolition democracy. So my vision really came uh, from them, their, their, their language they use. And when you use the low word abolition, you're talking about transformation. I'm not talking about modest reform, right? Mm -hmm. But my, the, the beauty of understanding residential caste is once you understand it and its processes, the way forward becomes obvious. You just reverse those processes. So um, the first thing I say is uh, we need to change the relationship of the state with descendants from, from punitive to caring, change the lens in which we see them, mm -hmm. right? Dare I say with love, right? Um, but once you see descendants as three-dimensional human beings who are capable of, 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 of agency and, and potential assets, um, it frees you up to focus on and identify evidence-based policies that actually might be cheaper than what we're doing, which is basically you know, mass incarceration and over-policing and more effective. Um, and I, then, I, so you first you got to change the lens. But I also say you, we need to reverse the processes. So um, inclusion rather than exclusion and boundary maintenance. You know, mandatory inclusionary zoning, uh, mandatory affordable housing for all neighborhoods, um, uh, green lining rather than red lining. Investing in historically defunded. Black neighborhoods, the very neighborhoods that were redlined in the 30s and cut off from uh, traditional um, mortgages and, tra and tradition and investment to, to this day are, are, are disinvested in and, and, and distressed, right? So they should be first in line for new infrastructure dollars if we get some. They should be first in line for community investment, community development dollars. Right, there's, there's studies in, in, in Chicago, I have this stat, uh, Chicago spends three times more money in white neighborhoods than black neighborhoods um, in its development dollars. That's not right. So, uh, so having a neighborhood analysis and racial equity analysis 
paying attention to where the money goes and prioritize disrupting um, the unfair allocations. And then third, and this is what's been in the news so much, right? Uh, I don't profess to have all the answers, but we must transform policing from predatory to humane. And I offer examples of, of innovative programs that reduce gun violence uh, dramatically just by focusing on these young people who the, the, the relatively small number of, of young people, they're young to me, young men typically, who might actually be likely to pull a trigger or who, who actually are engaged in gun violence and haven't yet been uh, prosecuted, um, wrapping services around them and giving them lo a loving mentor and, and giving them a life plan as, as uh, Richmond, uh, California did, dramatically reduce gun violence. It's a lot cheaper than incarceration. Um, so, you know, I give a, I give a, a, some, some hopeful examples in the book of places that are doing transformative things. Um, there are things we can do. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a number of uh, questions, good questions. And let me ask one. Um, what do you see as a first step cities, states, entities with power can take to begin dissolving the caste system in the US? Well, I really do think the first system is, um, it sounds very self-serving, but I really do think it would help to read the book. Just, you have to really understand what is going on and how systemic it is. I really identify all of the systems that are set against black neighborhoods. Um, but um, I really do believe that the first step is intentionally changing your lens mm. from thinking of people as human beings and potential assets rather than deficits, right? Like, you know, um, so, so that, that, that's a first, but also, um, a neighborhood analysis at the local level. You should put into your budgeting process and, and Seattle, the Twin Cities and Baltimore are doing this now where you regularly, annually assess and look at where dollars been, have been spent and, and intentionally try to achieve racial equity. This is what Joe Biden at the, you know, I was so inspired within hours of being inaugurated. Joe Biden signed an executive order calling for a racial equity um, um, exercise and put Susan Rice uh, in charge, a formidable woman, a mm -hmm. friend, right? Um, and, and basically said, we are going to start paying attention to how we're spending, and the federal government spends so much money, right? Uh, just paying attention to this and then you know, intentionally trying to disrupt a process of, 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 if we do nothing, what tends to happen is affluent people are the squeaky wheel and they get more than their fair share in their regions. Um, so being overt about that. Uh, and then, you know, there, there's so many dimensions, but Du Bois and uh, Angela Davis talked about Abolition is, is, is as much about building up as it is about tearing down and that you need to, to, to repair democracy as you go, right? Um, we should grow the multiracial coalition that, that claims Black Lives Matter and build and keep, you know, sustain the coalition. So you have people who will show up at zoning meetings to, to say, I stand for affordable housing everywhere, or who will fight for integrated schools, right? Um, it's a it's it's a multi pronged thing. There's no silver bullet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so your your um, discussion reminds me of the concept of beloved community that right. Nick and you know people in the civil rights movement would um, would discuss, and I, I think it's uh, quite resonant with what you're saying about starting from love. Um, so. Uh, Cheryl, there are questions about um, examples of locations, cities, 
that have made real progress. You mentioned Richmond, California and guns. Can you give us some other examples of, of cities that have taken the kinds of steps that you think are important? Well, you might be surprised. I, Louisville, um, Kentucky, which I feature quite a bit in the chapter on schools, um, was a very segregated, uh, segregated in its neighborhoods and segregated in its schools. Um, about 90% of the uh, students who went to schools were black in the city and 90% was white in the outlining area. Over a 20 year period, uh, through a series of actions, the Louisville metro area uh, became much more integrated and built a constituency of people who volunteered and you know this is what parents involved would want you know you had a majoritarian politics in which they, they the majority of people wanted integration and when they um uh, after they got out in their court order with with uh, school desegregation they continued their school integration um they consolidated the government city and county um and residential segregation went down a lot in that area. It went from being a hyper segregated metro area to just being mo moderately segregated. That is success, right? Mm -hmm. Now they, they and now they've done a lot of education around what happened in the thirties and why it is that black neighbors in the West End um, are the way they are and why they need more resources. So there's been, you know, despite the, you know, so much lately, the, the the city is associated with Breonna Taylor's death, right? Mm -hmm. They still have work to go. Where, 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 uh, uh, they have miles to go, but um, they went from being hyper segregated to much less segregated, and they have they've done a pretty good, damn good job with creating and maintaining integrated schools, much better than a lot of other places. A lot of other places in the South white areas are trying to secede from the school districts. Right. Um, so Cheryl, uh, I, I wanna go back to the conversation we were having about essentially, um, you know, affluent blacks being a part of elite spaces. There's a question about that. And it's asking about how people, how individuals can rectify the disconnect of identifying as a member of elite spaces while trying to strive for abolition of the institutions and structural barriers that have allowed some people to thrive, both mm -hmm. black and white. So there's a dissonance between yeah, there what is. and what we're trying to do. There is, you know, and I mean, I'm you, you, arguably I'm guilty of it, although I, you know, I live in one of the there's two stably integrated neighborhoods in the district with a long, I mean, like a 50 year uh, tradition of black professionals living with whites and Jews, right? Um, um, and I'm in one of the, I was in one before Shepherd Park, now I'm in Crestwood, right? Um, so I, 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 I chose integration, right? Um, this neighborhood I'm in is not economically integrated. Um, it's not far, but my, here's my point. Um, there's more appetite for integrated spaces, stably integrated spaces than there are schools and, re and neighborhoods to fulfill that appetite, right? Um, because of our policies. Uh, so, I'd say, yes, there's dissonance, but while you're living your life, you can lend your time and treasure to organizations that are trying to make life better. You can uh, vote for and support policies that will make life better, even if you yourself are not um, in close proximity to people who are really struggling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is a question that's asking about your writing process, asking about uh, what, what it was like working with your editor. And uh, the most interesting part of the question is, what did you leave out of, of the final publication? And can you talk about that? Well, writing is, uh, 
it's it's both a joy for me. It's also I, I don't struggle when I'm, I'm I'm I mean I don't I don't I've never had writer's block. I've never understood that, right? You know, I I enjoy the craft of writing. You know, I go to bed every night reading good writing. I love literature, right? Um, for me, this is my fifth book, and my process is when I have an idea, I get a book deal with a deadline for submitting the book. I, I can't write unless I have a deadline. And I'm if I got a deadline, I'm very focused. And for me, my friend is word count, you mm. know, and I, I, I'll just say I write, you know, when I've got the, the research done and I'm ready to write, you know, I map it out and I set a, a goal. When I was young, I'm not young anymore. Um, not gonna say my age though. <laughs> but when I was younger, I would try to bang out a thousand words a day. I can't do that anymore. But as I was writing this, I would say you know, 500 words a day. Some days, if I just wasn't feeling it, I would say something easy that I knew I could accomplish 300 words a day. Once you start, you'll start. But it's just getting up and doing it. Um, this film about a, a documentary about um, my heroine, uh, Toni Morrison, she said that she would get up at 5 a.m. I can't get up that early. I would get up at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. When, when the house is quiet and try to get my 500 words done. And you know, if you just say you're gonna do a certain number of words and just commit to that, uh, you know, in 10 days, you got 5,000 words. In 10 days, you get, it, it, the math just helps. In a month, you've got, you know, 15,000 words. Most books these days are like 80, 80 to 100. They, a lot of them don't want you to get too long because my publisher doesn't want you to get too long. Uh, what was left out in this book? In this book, nothing. Hmm. I spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, I really did. And uh, this book, I'm not thinking. Um, others, I'm sure there was, yeah, there was stuff cut in others, but um, well, thank you for your question. <laughs> yeah, well, as I said at the top, it's very well structured. It's, it's, it's a model in so many ways. So uh, I, I'm not surprised to hear you say that you, you didn't leave anything out. You, you, you really did it um, in a very powerful way. So other questions. Uh, someone wants to know how the Bronx is doing in terms of um, these issues. Was I wish I could tell you, I can't speak to the Bronx. I haven't been there. Um, I, I don't have any specifics to offer. I know that the Bronx is not what the Bronx was way back in the day, that there's been an extraordinary amount of redevelopment um, you know, since Reagan took, I think he was the South Bronx, Reagan went to, you know, but I wish I could speak to it, but I, I don't have any firsthand knowledge. I will say in, in a, a, a coda to the previous question, um, I have a degree in electrical engineering. I also have a law degree. And I definitely, you said you were, I, I, you were talking about how powerful it is and how it terms it's laid out. It's the engineer in me that built the argument. You know, each ch each chapter builds on the other and builds on the other and builds on the other. And then, you know, so I melded the passion of history with just sort of a scientific systems approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I definitely can see it. Um, <laughs> there's a question about whether your book is in dialogue with race for profit, how banks and the real estate industry undermine black home ownership. Do you know that work or can you speak to yeah, that? Absolutely, I cite it. It, it. I cite it in the chapter on opportunity hoarding and I commend that book to you. Um, it, 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 it's shocking how much whatever black wealth we had in housing has been taken, stolen from black people um, through predatory lending, through, you know, installment contracts, which are, are have re resurfaced. Tahanahasi Coates writes about it in the, the case for reparations, how black people were preyed on with installment contracts in the 60s, you know, where it's like you're buying a house on layaway and you don't get any equity until you make the very last payment. Well, private equity firms, uh, after the foreclosure crisis of the 
you know, 2008, 2010. Um, I've prayed in the very neighborhoods that suffered the most of fair foreclosure crisis because they were preyed on with predatory loans, subprime loans. Um, they, they're going in there and they've been snapping up foreclosed houses. Like they might pay 5,000 for it and then turn it around, not fix it up, nothing, and then sell it for 30,000 with an installment contract, which is designed to fail. Mm. It, they, they want the installment uh, buyer to miss one payment. They want them to fail. And what do they do? They just churn it up and give it to another person, right? So they are transferring hard earned dollars from essential workers to titans. Uh, you know, it's, it, and I learned this stuff in part from that book. It's, it is, it, you see how animated I am? It just makes me angry. Like descendants can't win, mm -hmm. even when they're trying to win. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so Cheryl, let me go back to the Bronx. Uh, there, there's a person who notes that the Bronx is majority Latino. Mm -hmm. And the question is whether, or what the key differences are between the black experience and the Latino experience. And of course there's some people who are both. Yes, absolutely. So the, the, the key difference is that black people, um, I, I told you the story about the great migrants. Uh, before like ni the 1990s, I'd say, um, let's say 1980, okay. Black people were the only population singled out for hyper segregation, right? Latinos were moderately segregated, right? Before this is this is um, Douglas Massey's book American Apartheid, right? Um, at one point in the 20th century, there were nearly 50 hyper segregated cities in this country. Um, and, and, and all of them were places where the great, great migrants ended up, right, in large numbers, right? So the, the segregation has been a defining feature of the African-American experience, and it continues to have consequences to this day, right? In ta Coates writes about this in um, the case for reparations, his piece in the Atlantic uh, magazine, a, for an African-American making $100,000 tends to live in a neighborhood with the accoutrements and amenities of what whites making $40,000 get, mm -hmm. right? So, but as the uh, Latinx Hispanic populations grew with immigration, there are like two cities, two, some areas in New York and LA where um, some Hispanics became hyper segregated, but it, what, it's not the defining feature. Now there's, you know, the defining feature of oppression for Latino people, I would say is, you know, the sort of anti-immigrant rhetoric, racing them, oh, you know, Donald Trump, the things he said about Mexicans. Um, so, you know, I, and I say this both in the beginning, the introduction to this book and in the conclusion, I say that I want to make it clear. I'm not saying that other groups have not experienced oppression, and and uh, I'm not saying that they don't experience it now. Um, I'm writing about residential caste, and residential caste was constructed based on anti-black animus that continues. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's unique, but that's not to say that other groups haven't. Uh, suffered and continue to suffer. Right. I make that clear. Yeah. Yes, you do. Um, so it's time for the last question, Cheryl. And it is a question about uh, asking if you have any hope. So things get seem so bad sometimes. Uh, it seems like there is no way forward. What keeps you going? This questioner wants to know. So hope is a choice. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we're in a tough, tough time when you and overlay a pandemic with this. It's, and, you know, residential caste, there's, there's a reason why there's disproportionate death in Black and Latinx neighborhoods, right? Um, lower opportunity or um, pre existing conditions. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but residential caste causes health disparities, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
optimism is a choice. My feeling is the forces of darkness in this country, and there's a lot of forces of darkness, want you to be de so depressed you won't get up and try to fight for anything different, mm -hmm. right? And I try to offer, and we've talked about some, some transcending scenarios or, you know, choices people some localities and places are making for something different right um we have to it, it, we have to have hope and have to keep trying um because if we if we keep if we give up and don't try we're just going to get more of the same mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well i think your uh the the chapter where you talk about abolition is a very hopeful chapter. And uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you again for writing the book. And I'm going to send it back over to Hillary of the Harvard Bookstore. Thank you so much, Tomiko, for doing this for me. It's my pleasure. <laughs> thank you both, actually. This was really wonderful. Um, and thank you to our audience out there for spending your evening with us. You can learn more about this important book and purchase White Space Black Hood on harvard.com. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a good night, keep reading, and everybody please be well. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Hillary, that was great. Thank so you. I think that turns